There we go. Now I'm ready to rock and roll. Uh, I'm very excited about the tour coming up. For all you viewers out there, Eric wanted a multi-city tour. So we're doing the Channeling Eric um, tour of effing enlightenment. And it's going to go to uh, Denver, New York City, Orlando, Chicago, Austin, San Diego, and Vancouver. And Sedona. And Sedona. <laughs> That's right. It's going to be so much fun, guys. And in Sedona, we'll probably go to the Vortices and do a meditation at sunset or something fun. Or we'll go to, and or we'll go to Red Rock. You guys have got to come. It's on the blog, the dates and everything. We don't have a way to register yet, but that will come soon. And it's going to be very inexpensive. Uh, you'll get access to other, uh, of course, Heather and Kim will be the main liners. That didn't sound right. The main events. And, uh, but we'll have all sorts of uh, mediums, uh, energy healers, maybe a past life of fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Eric Palusa. That's what it is. So keep in touch uh, with me, guys, about that. Uh, I mean, keep abreast of the situation by checking out on the blog, and I'll make announcements on the YouTubes from time to time. So, Eric. Do you think we can bring in Eric Harris and, um, what's his name? Oh, Dylan Claybold, the Columbine uh, killers? He goes, <clears throat> he wiped his brow. Sure, Mom. He's like, phew. Well, what that's was a, that? What was that for? It's a, it's tall, a order? Tall, tall order. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, then I better brace myself with a sip of coffee. Okay, so he's um, he kind of stepped out. He's he's he brought for, uh, forward the first gentleman. Um, they must have been like uh, similar in age. For those of you who don't know me well, um, I'm very disconnected to any sort of um, kind of pop culture, social events, current events. I, I'm very disconnected for from all of that stuff um, because you don't want the filters, or because you don't want the negativity, or. All the above. All, all the above. <laughs> Plus, it's you live too, on a farm, right? Yeah, it's too hard to keep up with. Oh yeah. Um, but anyhow, he brings forward um, the first gentleman, uh, and they they must have been similar in age because he's um, he his energy is very similar to Eric's in certain ways. <clears throat> oh great. Um, okay, so then the second gentleman stepped forward on the other side of Eric. Um, <laughs> Eric goes, "They're all yours." And he kind of, like, pushed them forward, helped them step forward. All right. Well, I guess one question I want to – first of all, I want to say thank you for coming. Um, of course. this. Um, the second one that stepped forward, um, he's very grateful to have this opportunity to talk, he says. Yeah, to explain to the world, uh, you know, what, what went down. Could you walk us through that, your thought processes? What, why? Uh, am I talking to Dylan? Or yeah. Eric? Okay. Yeah, this Dylan. is Dylan. Um, Dylan feels much, um, much more involved emotionally um, with this event. Um, okay, to answer your question, why he kind of he sits down and he does this with his face. He's like, "Whew." Um, he, he goes, he goes. And then your Eric stepped in. He says, now, Mom, make sure you ask them the spiritual meaning or the physical meaning because there's two, there's both. There's two, yeah. There are two different answers. Oh, well, um, let's let's his, have both of them. Let's talk about the physical reason, the, the, you know, the human reason first. That's where he's going first. That's where Dylan's going first. He says, um, I had so much anger and frustration um, for so many reasons built up inside me, and I didn't know how to let it out. Um I didn't know what to do for myself. I didn't know. He says he has um, mental. He, he, he keeps going like this: borderline mental illness, and then he says mental illness. Okay. Um, multiple depression, anger issues, major anger issues. He says. Um, so I didn't know how to deal with those properly. Dylan says. Um, but that and it. Okay, um, he's talking really fast. He says that in itself, um, battling that, what I had going on emotionally, mm -hmm. um, left me on edge. So anytime something didn't go my way, he says, um, 
I, lit the smallest things would trigger me. He says, just the smallest things would set me off and piss me off and um, just send me right into that anger zone. So um, when I feel, he's very honest and very blunt. He says, when I felt like things weren't going my way, I wanted to retaliate no matter what it was. Um, Now, in this sense, why I'm going to quickly take out my earrings here because they're they're knocking. Okay. Um, He says... Now, why why take so many lives? Why go to that extreme? Um, I felt powerless. I felt very insufficient to myself. Uh, he, he says, I didn't have any value. I didn't have personal value. Value of what, in life? No, I didn't value my own self. Oh, okay. Um, So I felt like, he says, I felt like if I could have control over others somehow, and again, here comes the language, but he goes, I know it's fucked up and I know it's twisted, but he says, if I had control over others' lives, I felt like I had power in those moments. Um, I know that's not the case now, he says. Well, did you do anything before this in a way of retaliation for your anger? Uh, like hurt animals or any siblings or um not as, he says not as much um because it he felt he says he did to some degree mm-hmm. <clears throat> he was verbally abusive he says oh. um to family members friends and then he says they began to fall away like friends sure. he had less and less um because he was verbally abusive, but he said retaliating it on a minor scale wasn't enough. So it wasn't even worth his energy, he says. Um, you know, acting out in anger towards siblings or towards animals, um, it still felt insufficient. He, he says he needed, um, he needed to affect a larger scale. So... And then he actually says, um, who, you know, because I, I kind of asked him again, I said, well, why hurt innocent people? Why did you do that? Mm. And he said, um, yeah, God, <laughs> this is hard. Oh, you can do it, baby. He says they, um, Pete, when Pete, in his uh, physical life, when people seemed soft and emotional, that irritated him. He needed to be around strong, ego-driven people. And Is when it because he saw, he, oh, go ahead. go ahead. Is it because he felt like they were had the power of being vulnerable and he didn't? He said absolutely, I but I didn't that. understand it at that time. Yeah. He says, but it pissed me off when they were like that, when they were vulnerable, and it it made me sick and it made me mad. And I didn't, I didn't, I went, those were my targets, the people that could be soft and kind and happy to everybody and bubbly because I couldn't be that way. Mm. And it made me sick. Like, oh, he keeps calling him a certain word. And I don't know if I want to use that word because <laughs> I'm just, just not in my vocabulary. Um, All right, but you don't have to. What does it start with? A P, <laughs> you know, soft people. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, I don't like that word either. Yeah, I don't either. Um, but he, he says, that's how I felt towards them um they were all soft they were all mushy gushy and emotional and I couldn't be that way and it pissed me off that's why he hurt innocent people he says um but it was he says that feeling of control in those moments was was fleeting it was it was more disgusting than what I was doing itself because I, I knew I knew it would it's not a It's not a true sense of fulfillment. Were you under the care of a psychiatrist? Back and forth. Okay, what what about your childhood? How did your parents, did you have a good, uh, good parents, good parenting? Did they do the best they could? He says, um, that was rough, it was difficult he says growing up he was difficult for his parents um and he says 
the older I got, like the more expressive I got and the less they were able to help. Oh yeah. Um, then they just kind of, they weren't sure what to do. Um, he says, um, he just kind of stopped and looked at me. He goes, I know this is hard. I know this is hard because yeah. <laughs> it's his, he's, he, he's conveying how much anger he had and it's making me shake. But at the oh. same time, it's out of, it's out of love, you know, to describe the situation. Mm-hmm. It's not like he's stuck in that anger now. No. But, um, then he, he talks about his partner. Um, and it's like he brought, uh, Dylan almost feels like he had all the ideas as far as how we're going to plan this attack. Ah. He says, um, he, I started with a lot of the ideas and I brought my friend along for the ride. Mm. And it's kind of like just it clicked with him. Once he shared his ideas with his buddy, it just, I mean, they, they grab it. He says, we gravitated towards each other in our anger and frustration. And it made us sick how people, he said, in um, the emotional side of it physically, um, he said, it just made us angry and sick how people could just randomly be happy. And those were our targets. That's horrible. Well, did y'all know you were going to die? Um, 50-50. He says, we, we kind of thought it might be a possibility um, by the law taking us down, um, that that might be possible. But we had we knew we had big intentions to create mass destruction, mm. but we didn't. He says, there's actually a huge part of me, this is Dylan still, um, that really didn't believe we could achieve such mass destruction. Mm. Um, I knew I wanted to, and I was going there, and I was going to do it, but I really, part of me still didn't believe that I was going to do it. I was capable. So when it started happening, it was just um, like bulldozing the situation. Like once it started, I couldn't stop. Were you scared? He said, very. Oh. He says, in those moments when you realize the destruction you can cause, you become, he says, your own worst enemy doesn't justify how sickened you are by your own actions and how scared you are of your own self. Because it, he says, I felt in those moments like I completely separated from who I am. Mm. Growing up, he says, you know, I had emotional instability. But you always think of murderers as monsters and something completely separate from who, from yourself mm-hmm. and then in those moments I flashed back to my childhood he says and I I could he says it was like an out-of-body experience I was viewing myself he says it was me looking at my actions through my child eyes and I was scared to death of who I had just become yeah. Um, And he says, I felt like I completely separated from my own self, from who I am. Um, But somehow it's, he felt once he started, he was stuck. Like he was stuck and to keep going to do as much as he could and then lights out, he says. Did, uh, so he, they took their own lives. Were you afraid to pull the trigger and take your life? I guess you took your life, right? That's what it said in Wikipedia. I just read it right before I started the session. He says he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to die. Um, And he says more so because he had separate, he says I had separated from myself and my emotions. Mm. And it's like a complete blackout state of being completely numb nothing affected me in those moments so he says he wasn't afraid to die and he says i didn't feel anything Mm. well um um i was going to ask it was really important oh yeah was there one incident that triggered the decision you know that was the reason why you said you said hey we're going to do this Somebody made fun of you, a girl spurned your your affection, anything? Um, yeah, he says yes. It's hard to understand him. He says, 
like blah 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 pissed me off so I'm trying to figure out what that it's like I can't understand that a, f- a friend feels, or a peer um I th- oh he says I thought it was a friend oh it almost feels like um He's talking about two things, two things that pissed him off. Um, an instructor, somebody above him, like a teacher or an mm-hmm. instructor, mm-hmm. that he thought, I thought they had my back. And it's almost, um, unfortunately, this is hard. Um, like, I thought they had my back in the class. Perhaps it, he makes me feel like he wasn't doing well in the class, but he was cool with his teacher, so the teacher was going to get him through. But grades came back, and... He says, um, mine weren't so pretty, so I felt betrayed. That yeah. triggered spite. That triggered anger. But then also there's a connection to a female. Mm. He says, um, I don't understand. He's talking about, it feels like either, uh, I think it's just a friend. It doesn't feel like a girlfriend. Um, but a close female relationship. And he says, um, feeling betrayed again but it wasn't intentional from her it was more um it was like i felt betrayed because she could be happy other people could make her happy oh. and i didn't understand that because nobody could make me happy i couldn't be happy with mm. friends i couldn't get to that place where she could mm. and um for a while he thought he was a source of her happiness but he says when I began to see her happy with other friends and other people I felt I very um he took he he took a scale here's my value with her and then when I saw her and other people could make her happy too then he um lowered his own self-worth and self-value based on that sure that he says it wasn't that he was pissed off at her he was angry at himself because um, of what he f- he and it's all this up, up he says it's all I created all there, it's not yeah. I thought um, he says I thought I was capable of making someone happy but again um, it was my own lack of connecting and making myself happy um, <clears throat> that ultimately disgusted me time and time again I just couldn't see it that way um, he always thought it was on the outside of him other people, other friendships and relationships um, well does Eric Eric Harris do you well first of all do you have anything to say about the human aspect of, of what happened and then we'll get into the spiritual Dylan but I also want to give Eric Harris a, a chance to talk um Eric Harris steps forward and he's he's very um, he comes across very mature and very um, um, very neutral like he doesn't express a whole lot of emotion but he it's he's at a very healed state is what it feels like um, <clears throat> he has a much bigger understanding of everything now he says and even himself he almost feels like a dad that's how he's coming across like yeah. just very intellectual very understanding and just that uh, mentor type of feeling but on the human aspect of it he says um, I had my own he's pointing to his heart he said I had my own problems I had my my own issues um, it didn't feel nearly as severe as Dylan's um, but he says I felt like in my life I felt like I was highly misunderstood mm. it, it, it wasn't so much battling any kind of mental illness he just felt like constantly I misunderstood and that just built anger what and did aggression. they not understand about you He actually says he relates a lot to er- your Eric. Um, when I tr- when I tried to talk people talk to people and I tried to build relationships, um, they just couldn't see me for who I am. They couldn't hear what I was trying to say. Um, he 
He says, um, mostly because something about the way he looks, the way he looked um, to people, like they couldn't get past his image to let him in, to talk to him. and His develop... physical, physical appearance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, something about the way he looks. I don't know. I don't remember how they looked. I don't either. Something about his image that people um, would trip up over. He says, um, but anytime I'd sit down and try to talk to people um, or try to connect to people, he, he f um, okay, what's, okay, he says he had a hard time connecting to people and understanding them and vice versa. Okay. Um, and it's, it's more like, um, he is, he says that he was somebody who, anytime I had a conversation with friends, family, no matter what, he, he says he would externalize everything and he had a hard time connecting to, to, and relating mm -hmm. to, um, what people would talk about. So, Every time I'd sit down and have a conversation or chill with my friends, I still felt like I wasn't really connecting. I didn't feel anything. Okay. That, he says, led to um, frustration. He felt misunderstood because he mm -hmm. couldn't connect. He couldn't express himself like he wanted to. Um, and so he feels more like he went not went along with the ride. I, I don't mean it to put it lightly as far as what happened. But um, he says... Um, when him and Dylan got together, it was like, okay, this is going to be my outlet. Um, people don't want to understand me, so this is an outlet where I can make you understand me. Mm. Um, it, it gave me a sense of power and control that I felt like I didn't have. And communication. He yeah. says, I felt like su I had such a barrier in communicating and I knew something like this would not be misunderstood, mm -mm. communicating this way. Um, now, when he says that, he's very, very emotional, um, showing a lot of remorse mm -hmm. about what he did. Um, but he says remorse with understanding. I understand why I did that, what happened. Um, he goes, and that's... That's right where we can get into the spiritual meaning if you want yeah. to. Let's do that, but let's do it really briefly because I don't want this to go so long that people see, ugh, it's 30 minutes, I don't want to watch this video. So, we all have short attention spans. So, was it a spiritual contract? If so, what was the contract? Um, both boys jumped up and said yes. Um, the contract was to raise awareness on um, youth, okay? He says this was, our spiritual contract was more to get attention at youth and the upbringing in youth and mental illness, mental health issues, emotional health issues, psychological health issues geared towards youth because um, that's what we were. We're, we're younger adults and we targeted that age group. Um, so it was more so meant to bring awareness to school systems and mm. um, kind of open their eyes a little bit, not only about security, but um, emotional, mental health issues and psychological health issues can start very young. And he takes it yeah. all the way down to kindergarten. Yeah. And he says, our contract was to open the eyes and bring awareness to health, mental health disease in youth. What do you they, what do you think they should do with should they have uh, additional gun controls or what what can we do do you think to uh, you know from your perspective as spirits to uh, lessen the frequency at least of these mass shootings? He says um, gun control might reduce the frequency but it's not going to cure the problem. He yeah. says what, what needs to happen is um, all the children, let them have voice. Um, now that's hard because you have to keep order to it when they're in a school mm. system. He says, but we're so conditioned to think you're in school, sit down, be quiet, listen to the teacher. Yeah. But 
you can't apply one thing to everybody and expect them all to um, saturate it the same way. He says, children and youth, young adults need to have more voice and be more expressive to maintain a healthier balance um, mentally, psychologically, he says. If that's the case, if we can begin to um, allow youth to have a voice, um, then you're going to see less frequency of this because kids okay. get trapped. He says adults, um, young yeah. adults get trapped in feeling misunderstood or feeling like they can't say what they need to and they don't have a voice. Then that frustration just festers. What about says. screening uh, school children for mental illness? There's all sorts of different screening tests. Would that help? He says, he says that would be a great idea right at the age of puberty yeah. um, because they're mature enough to um, to respond as needed, I guess, on the, mm -hmm. these tests, these screenings. Um, he says that would be a huge success. Well, one last thing. I would want to give you an opportunity, both of you guys, to uh, say something to the families of the victims. Any messages for them? Um, they're both um, crying and thanking you for giving them that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, whew. they say, um, who they're very emotional <laughs> oh, and you're picking say, up on that energy, huh? Yeah. Um, they say, <clears throat> first of all, um, to everybody watching this video, thank you for at least having heart enough to watch, um, to the families. <clears throat> we know the hurt we've caused and the depth of it. We hope that you can see the meaning behind it, and we hope that you can forgive us in knowing we didn't understand who we were, and we didn't understand how to deal with ourselves. And they both say they're speaking in sync. It's very fascinating how it's two different, two different sounds coming huh. across at the same time, but they say, from the depths of our soul, we're very sorry for hurting your families. Um, and we're very sorry for the hurt that we've caused ourselves as well, they say. Have you um, had a chance to uh, meet up with the victims on that side? How did that go? They said that they did. They showed me that um, early on in the interview. Um, that was gut-wrenching, they say. Very gut-wrenching. Because it was immediate. Um, mm. After they passed, they saw their victims... Um, but the he says the victims this was why it was so gut wrenching this is Dylan speaking he says because the victims were waiting they were um, of course there's a bit of a shock factor he says but they were waiting in understanding um, and it was almost like the victims were waiting for the boys to help the boys transition mm. um and so it was gut wrenching knowing we had just taken their lives, but here they are still coming at us with love. It, wow. It was beyond anything we could have prepared for. And I they, guess they, that's because they knew that they were all part of the same contract, making sacrifices together. Is that right? D Dylan says, yeah, that's why um, they were waiting in understanding because they, understa they understood at the moment of transition, um, they understood that they were a part of this, that this was a group contract. Um, so that's why okay. they were waiting for us. All right. One last question. Eric, my Eric, you want to ask any question? Or can you ask one question at least? He says to you or to the boys? To the boys. Eric says, I love this. He says... Um, He's asking them, he says, if you could change one thing about how this was viewed, what would you change? Oh, good. Um, and then the boys respond by saying, um, this is so heavily focused on guns that we didn't see, <clears throat> excuse me, we forgot to pick up what the underlying issues were, the mental issues, the health um, issues behind why this happened. This is how it happened, and he holds guns up 
<clears throat> and shows me guns. And um, he says, but this is where their focus stopped. They, they looked at the guns and they said, okay, we need more, more gun control. But they, they couldn't see past that. Um, so we hope that they, this can be viewed more as look at what mental health issues can do. Look at how, how it can really um, yeah. explode in a negative way. Yeah, it's not the gun that kills people. It's the person holding the gun. It's the illness, exactly, yeah. what Dylan says. Okay, well, anything else before we close off? Eric says, mwah, mwah, mwah. I love you, Mom. Oh, he always does that. I love you too, baby. Kisses back. And Eric uh, Harris and Dylan Claybold, thank you very much for having the courage to share your feelings and your ideas with the world. They both say thank you for giving them the opportunity to speak. They're very grateful. All right. Bye. Bye, Thank Kim. Thank you. I'll Bye, call you right everybody. Back. Okay. Bye.